my god. <laughs> if people who are watching this knew. I know. Good lord. <laughs> Good lord. Technology. I look a little fuzzy, but who knows why that is. At least we're talking. That's all right. That's all right. I feel a bit fuzzy, but you know. That's, <laughs> yeah, don't that's we all? Oh day God. to day. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks so much for joining us. You're, yeah, you're calling from the Room Room, your Room Room studio? Yes, Los Angeles. Yes, yeah. Or the outskirts of LA. Um, um, yeah. Uh, yes. Thank you for having me, Rod. This is, this is fun and awesome and exciting and, you know, um, and just a blast to be part of. Yeah, for ah. sure. Yeah. Man, it's all all our pleasure. So thank yeah. you for your time. I mean, before we get into things, let, there's a couple of things I'd like to do. And the first is of to pay, pay my respects to the um, Gadigal and Wangal people of the Aora Nation, who are the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm working today. Okay, and cool. Pay my respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people here or watching today. The second thing I wanted to do was just give you a really brief rundown of your incredible career and incredible discography. Oh, God. Six Grammy wins, if you don't mind. A discography that includes artists like, and I'm only going to list a few here, but it's still a long list. Audio Slave, Babyface, Johnny Cash, Michael Jackson, Janet Jackson, Prince, Juanez, On Vogue, Eric Clapton. <laughs> much Vogue. Oh my God, I forgot about In Vogue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long, long list. So look, incredible. Thank you so much for, for joining. We're yeah. really excited to talk to you. It's making me feel old thinking about all those. Oh my <laughs> God. Uh, Think of experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess. Yeah. Boy, oh boy. Hey, so before all those credits, there was a time when you didn't have a single credit, when you probably didn't even know what a mixing desk was or what a producer did and you were just getting into music growing up in Chicago. Yeah. What, yeah. what, what got you interested in music? Like what was, was there a moment that made you think? Yeah. Oh, you know, it's funny. I tell this story a lot. I was just telling my wife the story on Valentine's day again. She's heard it, but she likes to hear me talk about it. So I grew up and I'll go through it kind of quickly um, because everybody's backstory is, is I guess similar, but it's, it's always interesting and fun too. So I grew, grew up in, um, Cleveland, Ohio, in the Ohio region. So I was in the Midwest. Um, and I decided to go to, uh, uh, do my university work at Northwestern university, which, you know, um, shout out to NU. It's an amazing, amazing school. And I was part of the conservatory there. Incredible place. Um, and, um, Basically, Rod, at that stage of my life, um, I, you know, okay, I decided I want to do something in music. But it's just like you said, I did not know what I wanted to do, how I wanted to do it. I mean, I loved classical music. My my majors were, you know, concentrated in, in theory and composition and all this stuff, but, but um, in, in computer music too. But I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I didn't really know, like, what are the careers out there? Because it was a different time, like, you know, Berklee School of Music, for instance, you know, now is so immersed in the industry. But back then it was all just like performance. You know, Berkeley was the best place in the world you can go, but it was all like a lot of jazz performance and that kind of stuff or Juilliard for classical, blah, blah, blah. Um, so I didn't know what I wanted to do, um, but I knew I wanted to do something in music. So, you know, um, stumble into one class, another class, blah, blah, blah. Well, there was a program at Northwestern um, and I remember it fondly called Night School. Um, where it was really cool. All the local, um, not local, but uh, if you were in a student group, a student band or whatever it might be, um, we got to go into a recording studio. If you got picked, like everybody would, you know, send in their demos or whatever, and they'd pick like five, five bands um, every year. And we'd go in and we'd cut a song. Uh, it was great. And we'd make a vinyl and we'd really go in and record. Well, you know, through uh, the classes, kind of, I was, I was taking a recording class and then, a, you know, a modern synthesis class and all this stuff. And I was learning about tape machines and Moog synthesizers and all this shit. And then I'll never forget it. I walked in a recording studio for the first time and my mind exploded. I was wow. like, wait, this is how Pink Floyd and Steely Dan and blah, blah, blah. Everybody had done all those crazy things at the time. Like, this was about recording. Like, I had only heard about, you know, tape machines and consoles, like you're saying. And to walk in and to like 
aesthetically like see it and feel it and watch how it's done is like, you know, it, it blew my mind. It blew my mind. And so that was it. I was like, all right, this is what I got to do and how I got to do it. Um, and, um, you know, the story goes from that point. Um, my dog's interrupting me. because Sorry, <laughs> this, is, this is life in the studio with the canine. Um, so at that point, um, I was lucky enough right at the end of my college career to start to intern at an amazing recordio, recording studio in um, downtown Chicago, which was incredible. And I was learning like, you know, all the studio chops I would need to learn um, uh, while I was there, which was great because I got this amazing education um, on, you know, on the tape machines and on the, um, on the recording consoles that, you know, still to this day are, you know, as esteemed as it gets. You know, I remember one of the rooms was a, a Neve 8078 for the tech heads out there. And the other room was a brand new SSL. And like, and I was, you know, 21 years old and I was learning how to work these and, you know, uh, and tape machines and all this stuff because way before computers and right. Pro Tools and all this stuff, which was great. And I will um, shout out to, I got to say this, to the generation that I came up in because I was lucky enough to not see the emulations of those, like the plugins and the whatever. I saw the real and learned on the real mm. thing. And then, you know, here I am today sitting and seeing all these, you know, things come up that are the emulations of that are not the real thing. And, and look, the way we make music now is amazing and, um, and very, you know, easy to a degree compared to the way it was. It's, you know, we can talk about that term forever, the easy part of it. But, but um, I was lucky enough to see it go from, you know, the, the deep analog world to getting into the digital world. And it's, you know, it's much like the film industry now, you know, those guys, you know, shot on analog on film forever. And it was a lot of work and whatever. Now they do digital and it's not to get into that topic of what's better or what's easier. But yeah. anyway, um, back to the, like the way I happened, that's the way it went. I was, I was working in the, uh, in the in incredible studio in Chicago and learning from these amazing, you know, producers and musicians and arrangers like, yeah. You know, it was great. It was incredible. And it was the education that um, that um, I needed to prepare for the big time as oh. well, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So thinking back, thinking back about about that time in Chicago, are there one or two lessons you learned then that, that still really resonate with you today or that set you up for what would come next? Oh, sure. Um, that I think in every scenario, there's always something to learn, not only musically speaking, speaking, but kind of psychologically and sociologically speaking, because, you know, um, what we were doing back then, and again, I'm dating myself many, many years ago, but what we were doing back then was, it was a lot of commercial work during the day because Chicago is a very big, you know, jingle place. And there was a lot of commercial work going on and a lot of fast pace. And, and again, this was pre, um, you know, a lot of computer stuff. So there were, we were like 8 a.m. Musicians were loading in like the guitarists and the keyboards and the string players. It was awesome. And getting them all in like microphones. Okay, we got to go. And like working out the arrangement right there. And then like, and uh, learning from that thing. But also, you know, Back to your question, though, uh, what I can remember learning the most is there was always something to soak up technically and musically, but also the psychology of working in an environment like that um, it taught me a lot about, like, you know, communication skills in the sense of, like, a lot of times you'd be working with people that weren't very musical but thought they were or... Right. Um, or we're speaking in a different way and you had to kind of like talk them around it, you know, and I saw the song and dance go down. And then, you know, outside of that world in that studio, for instance, uh, there was a lot of record making going on at night. So, you know, you know, come three or four o'clock, the business end of things. And then like, you know, cats would be moving. And a lot of times there were like, you know, heavy records were come ministry was coming in or something like that. It'd be like, Whoa, okay, this is different from like <laughs> the jingle world. I mean, like, you know what I'm saying? It was, it was yeah. an incredible education. And I thank God and the stars in the universe that I was able to um, be immersed in it. It was right place, right time, you know? Right. 
to kind of prepare me for, you know, the, like I said, the big time, because I did that for a couple of years and then I realized this is awesome. Um, I want to be part of the, the real thing. Cause that's when, you know, kind of talking about, you know, what you guys do in your world. I was reading, listening to these records and reading the credits and like right. hearing about these guys and these studios where shit was going down. And I was like, I gotta be a part of that. I'm 20 something. Right. And if it's not going to happen now, I don't want to do it. I don't know how I'm going to do it and when I'm going to do it. So yeah. um, that's when I made the transition from, from Chicago to Los Angeles. And um, lucky enough, um, again, circumstantially, the, the, a lot of the cats I was working with in Chicago, I, you know, sat them down. I'm like, you guys are amazing for what you do. Do you know anybody that you can connect dots for me with in Los Angeles where I can, you know, maybe get a job, you know, starting as, you know, bottom level at a studio. And, and luckily they did that. And um, that's how I got started at Larrabee Studios. The studios. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the famed Larrabee, which is, you know, still, still, uh, you know, the, the, as famed as it gets. Um, yeah. What was it like? So walking in there for the very first day, do you remember that and how you felt? I do. I do. Um, <laughs> I, uh, what, what, what was amazing about it? Okay. So a couple back is I remember like when I went in and I flew into Los Angeles and I did some interviews, um, and I talked to Larrabee and it, Look, I mean, again, to your credits, uh, to support the world of credits, I went, I, I had a list of five studios I wanted to go see. I don't remember the other three, but I remember Ocean Way and I remember Larrabee Sound because these were studios where all these amazing records were coming out of. And I was like, I got to work in one of these places. And um, as luck would have it, I got job offers within the next couple weeks because these studios were so busy and... You know, luckily, I was um, I was young enough that uh, I don't know if it was about age, but I again, my experience really, really lend itself to okay. You know, I think this guy might be a good fit at our studios and such uh, because I had the technical experience, I had the musical experience, blah blah blah. So anyway, I I, um, I remember coming out getting getting uh, the job offers, and then um, to your question, yeah, walking in that first day and being like. Oh my God, this is like, this is the place. This is where it, where it hits. And um, shout out to a guy, I'm sure he's not on this chat, but um, I ran into him at a, at a Grammy function a couple of years ago and he didn't remember it. But the first guy whose sessions that I worked for was Alan Meyerson, who is a highly esteemed engineer producer. I mean, he did a million records and now he does all Hans Zimmer's films and he's like, Cream of the crop. Um, and I, I'll go on and tell you all the people that I work with at Larrabee, like Dave Way, I mentored under for, for long. He's a genius and made so many amazing records. And like all these people I was working under and the artists, of course, that we'll talk about. But it was like the environment was like kaboom. Yeah. And um, I was nervous, but um, I have uh, I have a lot of good, good memories about especially like working with Alan because Alan was really tough, like in the studio. He was really tough about like patch cables and this and like um, and all this just awesome shit. And um, it was great because I was learning. I, I you know, I uh, I'm a big supporter about like, you know, you got to be tough when, uh, you know, when things need to be in line. And, you know, I mean, it, it was still the rock and roll business. I don't remember what he was working on. And um, and I was an assistant on his sessions. I was like, you know, uh, kind of shadowing another guy that was was um, was the number one in the room, but after a couple of days, I was I was assisting and stuff. But he was making big records. God, what was it? Um, or orchestral maneuvers in the dark. OMD. Do you remember that band? I do. That yeah, was the first maybe that maybe that. that was it. If that was it, I'd blow my mind. Um, <laughs> but um, but it's like just so many. I mean, the the now my memory's flowing like. Dave Bianco, um, recently deceased Dave Bianco, was another guy who worked out of there all the time. He was awesome. Uh, Keith Cohen, I worked under a lot. Another, all these guys were amazing mixer producers, like amazing. And, a, a, you know, shout out to Larrabee because all these people were coming in the door every day. It was like, you know, it was the top joint in the world um, where people were making pop records. And of course, as we know, um, 
it became Prince's one of Prince's favorite places. And and Dre, I mean, Dre worked out of there. Um, a lot of the heavy metal guys were working out of there. It was just like this these incredible rooms that um, everyone everybody wanted to you know mix or produce or whatever. It yeah. was amazing. So, well, I mean, gosh, there's so much to talk about there. But you mentioned you mentioned Prince, so let's let's have yeah. a chat about. Yeah. <laughs> I believe that you worked on, is it the Batman soundtrack in the Diamonds and Pearls? I worked in Pearl? the Bay, yes, band Diamonds and Pearls, yes, because I was working for, for Keith Cohen for uh, a while right then. So it was, you know, again, right place, right time. At that point, too, I got I to gotta go back a little bit on the Larrabee thing. It, you know, um, it is, that location has since closed, sadly, mm. but all the people that I was, um, that was on the engineering staff at that time, became like really, really, you know, I mean, Dave Way, Alan Myerson, all these people were clients, but but the people that were on the engineering staff were like people like Sylvia Massey, who turned around to be like, you know, produced P Tools, Tools yeah. first record, whatever. Everybody was, Dave Aaron um, became Snoop Dogg's guy. I mean, everybody that was working there at the time, we were all kids, but like everybody kind of like, you know, had a pretty good career. Uh, which is amazing to look back at. And um, I'm sure that happens in a lot of the big studios. But n when I look back, I'm like, man, that's just the the coolest shit ever. When I see like things like, like when Sylvia did Tool, I was like, oh my God, that's awesome. Yeah. And um, yeah, what? so and help Sylvia, by the way, at on back to your question, because I have a tendency to, you know, <laughs> digress. But back to your question, Sylvia was working a lot with Prince too. We all were because when he came into town, you know, he could work wherever he wanted to. He was working at, you know, uh, what is now Henson. It was A&M at that time. He's kind of floating around, but he liked Larrabee. It was close to where, you know, the house was he was renting. It was, um, it was very private, very small rooms. You can kind of get in and get out. And nobody, nobody, uh, nobody knew you were there. I think that's why Michael ended up, uh, liking it too. But, but anyway, um, yeah, Prince really liked it. And, um, there were two rooms at Larrabee. He had one um, that was sort of his, his tracking room that he set up with like, you know, all his tapestries and the roses and the whole bit. I mean, if you walk in and if you didn't know Prince was recording there, the moment you looked around, you're like, okay, Prince is recording here. <laughs> and this was before the purple guitar too. I mean, this was like, you know, that era, Diamonds and Pearls was, at least I think it was. Anyway, um, yeah, and the other room um, was the the mix room. Per se, with the big, they were both SSL, excuse me, SSL rooms, and um, yeah, it was awesome, and he was awesome, and and uh, I will only say that it was it was kind of like working with Batman because you never knew you'd be working on the track all day long or whatever, but you never knew when he was going to walk in, and right. like you know, two in the morning you'd turn around and there he was in the room, and he'd like come in silently. And just be like, you know, and he'd walk up to the console and turn up the volume and, you know, it was, wow. yeah, it was, it was crazy. Again, like, what, what do you learn from just even observing someone like that go about their, their craft and their work? God. What I learned from him was, and this won't surprise any musician nowadays, but like impulse is so important because he was just all about impulse. I remember... I don't remember what song it is. I should go back and listen, but I remember there was um, there was a song that needed a rhythm track, and he just started listening to the to the groove a little bit. He goes, "Man, this needs something else." And he walked into the studio, and he's like, "Is there any instruments around?" And there was some some small uh, hand percussion shit, nothing, but nothing really, uh, you know, specifically what he was hearing in his head. So he grabbed a pair of drumsticks. And, and he, there was a stool, a wooden stool. And, and I mean, you know, obviously we all know, and there's no surprise to anybody what kind of rhythm the guy had. Um, yeah. But I remember he put the stool in the middle. He's like, let's record this. We set up some mics really fast, ran it. And it was fast. I'm talking fast. He, like, he started playing this thing. And like, the next thing, boom, we hit record. And it like made the track go boop. You wow. Know, one of those tricks. Yeah. So you've got to be, you've got to be ready. Yo, my God, there, there you go. That's what I learned with him. You got to be ready. I remember one time in the control room, he wanted to lay a guitar part down and we were having a problem with the patch. 
or, or I was having a problem with the patch. And he's like, he's like, man, if I forget this riff, I'll never forget. He said that. I was like, God, please don't let me fuck this up and like let Prince forget a riff. So yeah, but that was one. Of, that's a memory I will tell my son someday, <laughs> which was funny. But he got the part down and uh, and it was cool. So right. But an in answer to your question, impulse. Like he was all about, you know. Yeah. Yeah. There's another credit from Larrabee and I'm I'm cherry picking the big ones here. And I'm sure this is another one that you get asked a lot about. And that was working with Michael Jackson yeah. on the day yeah. album. Yeah. What uh, I mean same same question. What what did you what is it like being in the room? What was it like being in the room with Michael? What did you observe from the way that he worked? Um wow. It was a long long time I was with him. So there's so many things I can say. Um, but I mean, I've got funny stories too, where I was driving him home from the recording studio at four in the morning because his limo driver, you know, fell asleep and Michael like let him go home and stuff. But we don't even talk about those. We can get to those if we have time, but, yeah. but those are funny stories. But, um, I just, I learned so, so, so much. I mean, him details 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 and you know um for better or worse taking a very 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 long time to get the kick drum sound right um right. he was you know all about the details you know and it was very important to keep the meticulous records and you know um everything you know and and there you go um back to kind of what i was saying uh earlier i i was pretty nervous at the beginning of those and again this is i was working at larabee and they were like hey do you want to be part of you know this session it was something like that or you know bruce swedeen rest in peace was um the main dude at that at that stage on that record um he was kind of executive producing and produces a um a good number of songs on it um as was billy betrayal um who's amazing talk about an inspiration for me um, you know, way back in my, in my, uh, in my past of like things that brought me to Los Angeles. I remember being, I was such a fan of Bill Betrells. I was like, I gotta meet and work with this guy. And then all of a sudden I'm working on a Michael Jackson record. I didn't work. I worked a day or two with Billy, but Billy worked alone a lot. And he had cats that he had worked with for, you know, many years. So I wasn't really pulled in, but Bill was down the hall while I was working in the other room and just, just to meet him and talk to him was like, Oh my God. Um, Cause he was doing black and white at the time, which, right. which to me still is one of his, uh, Michael's greatest songs. Sure. Because, yeah. It's amazing. Um, and, and by the way, that's, that is Billy Patrell doing the rap in the middle, um, which, you know, is incredible. And there's a story so, behind that. There's a story behind that too. They tried everybody. I mean, every rapper alive. I mean, I think LL Cool J, like everybody, you know, tried a, a shot at it. And uh, and Michael kept going back to the demo that Billy had laid. He's like, that's great. That's wow. great. Let's let's stick with that. And they stuck with that. <laughs> <laughs> and the vibe, still when I hear it to this day, I was like, man, that vibe, I get it. I get it. He had the, the, the foresight or the vision or whatever it was to like, you know, I mean, it, it, I'm going to say a lot of things everybody knows that he had vision. He had, um, you know, his sensibilities were, were amazing. You mm. know, um, did he, you know, perfectionism is, is a funny thing um, because you can get lost in it. Um, and there is, there is, uh, there is such a thing as like the, the importance of deadline, um, mm. which we can all, we can all probably, you know, <laughs> discuss the value of and such, because especially as artists. Um, yeah. uh, there was a guy that I worked with for many years, um, another amazing producer, and, and he, he had an adage that said, how long does a record take? Well, as long as you got. All right. You know, right. so if you've got a year, you're probably, especially as an artist, you're probably going to spend a year. Um, but, and I've been part of both of those type of things. Like, if you got to get it done in a week, the way they did it back in the 40s and 50s, or a couple of days, you know, when you're talking about Sinatra's era, like, you know, he did those arrangements 
everybody got in the studio and it was done on the radio the next day. I mean, <laughs> there's there's something to be said for that. It was amazing sure. because sure. you know you committed um, yeah. immediately. So um, so yeah, Michael <laughs> Michael got lost in the details a lot, and it right. uh, you know it took a long time. Sure. Um, you know, but it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. Um, yeah. yeah. One of the um, one of the I guess almost life changing experiences you had at Larrabee, and I think it was around the time you were working with Prince, is is that you met this Argentinian band, uh, Ilya Karaki and Valderamas. Ilya Karaki, actually, no, it was way after that. Okay. That I met I I Ilya Karaki. Um, I had, I believe, I had already kind of started to go out on my own, independent outside of Larrabee, or or you know. Or um, somewhere around then. What? Well, not way after, but maybe uh, you know, five, ten years after that. Um, and um, yeah, I got a call. I don't remember who connected those dots, but I got a call from um, somebody that was uh, working with this band from Argentina, Latin American alternative pop rock band, and they were looking for uh, you know collaborators, people to like co-produce and engineer mix, do the whole bit. Um, and I, I will say to this day, at that stage of my life, I had heard Latin music and knew a little bit about Latin rock. Latin. I didn't know anything. I really didn't. And I was like, yeah, cool. Um, because, you know, kind of in answer to some of your questions earlier, it's like, I was really into saying yes to as many things as I could. Mm -hmm. Because you can always, always, always learn. Um, and I, you know, before I met with the guys, I had heard a little bit of their music. I was like, wow, this is interesting. Because they were like alternative hip hop meets funk meets jazz. It was like Beastie Boys meets, you know, Steely Dan at times. Like, wow. you know, they were hip hop, but they were it, it, it really, really interesting. And, you know, I didn't know any Spanish at the time. And I was like, all right, I'll meet them. So we went and had lunch and they were like, Okay, let's do this. So um, then we recorded, and I think they were on Universal at the time. I believe so. Then we recorded, and we worked at a studio that's now defunct, sadly, um, over in Burbank called Ocean Studios. Amazing room. Huge room. Big old Neve, 8078 again. Incredible room. Tons of outboard gear. And I'm working with these guys, and we're making a, a live hip-hop record, okay? So it's kind of like... Imagine Kamasi Washington, but back then. But we've got live orchestra on it, like live horn section, like the whole bit. My mind is blowing. I was like, wait a minute. Is this is this Latin alternative? Because I want to be a part of this forever. So um, we made a very, very, very cool record together. And, you know, luckily it did really well. And it was uh, beyond it doing really well. They were never like a huge, huge, huge Latin act, but they were very highly respected in Latin. And they still are you know, very, um, you know, innovative thinkers and innovative musically and big deal to Argent Argentina. Yeah, actually, they are quite a big deal. But um, the uh, the most ex exciting and important part about it, at least for me, is that it became, you know, a bridge to meeting all these amazing people in the in the Latin portion of the industry, mm -hmm. um, which was, you know, incredible. Yeah. Did that did it change your perspective? Because, you know, quite often we get locked into thinking that music's coming from America or the UK or, or Australia, but you forget sometimes that there is this whole other world out there that has this incredible music. Did, did it open your eyes and broaden your Yeah, yeah, it did. I mean, again, luckily, luckily I had come from such a background, and I don't mean this brought on myself, but, you know, back to my college years, I was, you know, I had some really cool professors and, uh, Shout out to Northwestern University. The first class I took in music school was ethnomusicology. I wish I remembered that professor's name. And he came in the first day dressed in, in African garb. You know, he's a white guy, excuse the phrase, but dressed in African garb. And I found out that he had done like his doctorate um, on kalimba playing in Africa with like the real dudes. And I was like, oh my God what's this about? I thought I was going to be learning about Bach and Vivaldi and like, check this guy out. So my, my point is that I was early on when I was only 18, starting to realize, wow, cool music can come kind of from anywhere. Okay. Um, 
but but yeah, I mean, I did I know it? No, I didn't. I knew uh, kind of of it, but I didn't really know it because you know, especially like I got dropped into this world of like Los Angeles, the pop scene in the '90s, and man, it was like it was deep because you know it was the recording industry with like you know the Backstreet Boys and InSync and all that stuff was happening here and coming out of here and like you know and Prince and blah 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 all that stuff was was uh was cooking and big time um so i i you know was immersed in what you know what we were working on and what was popping and, and so no i didn't know it was you know it was going on but god the moment i heard it i was like okay this this is absolutely <laughs> something i gotta be a part of yeah. yeah yeah and you've done a lot of work in that genre now as I well have, i have knock on everything and it's been amazing um yeah. Kiyaki ended up introducing me to um, a fellow by the name of Gustavo Santolaya, who is wow. uh, amazing, a legendary producer, and, and now yeah. does a lot of score work and whatever. Gustavo knew the guys in Ilya, Ilya um, Dante um, and Emma. He knew the guys really well, because he knew Dante's father, um, Spinetta, who was a, an icon of Argentine music, and Gustavo's Argentine. And so I'll never forget that. I was mixing the Ilya Karaoke thing, and Goose came down to the studio and we met and um, we were just chatting a little bit and we got on and he's like, you know, hey, I got this new label on Universal. Um, what was it called? Circo. It was called Circo. Um, and I got this new label and I got this new artist, young guy from Colombia. Maybe we can work on it together. Um, he's, uh, he's done a lot of like kind of heavy, heavier stuff in Colombia, but he wants to do like a, a solo thing. He's, his name is Juanes. And, right. you know, that's that's how it happened. And I heard the demos like he had cassette demos. I was like, oh, yeah, I got to I got to be a part of this. And <laughs> yeah, that's how it, that's kind of how it happened. Yeah. Um, you know, so back to the like saying yes to everything. You just never know. And it's mm. not about the success. You just never know how stuff's going to turn out. You know, um, I am one to find the musical value, maybe to a fault. Um, but to find the music value in, in uh, almost anything. But also, I come from a place where, especially working on so many different stuff, different things and working with so many different people, it's like, um, you know, a lot of times it just takes a little nudge this way or a nudge that way, and it becomes something, you know, different and maybe cooler or, you know, I guess that's yeah. what production is a lot of times. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I in terms of chronology, I'm not, you're going to have to correct me here, but you were start working with Rick Rubin. I'm not sure if it was a little bit after this or. Yeah, little... Scott, <laughs> you're really walking through. This is your life. Um, <laughs> yeah, Rick was after that. Rick was, Rick was after I was, you know, I was doing a lot of the Latin stuff, but still kind of active. I, I still was active in, you know, in the, in the studio scene here in LA. And I don't remember what the first thing was. Oh, I know what it was. Um, I was still working on and off with Dave Way. My, my dog really wants me to throw this ball. Sorry, guys. Um, so this is what always happens. Like the moment <laughs> he's on the couch 24-7, but the moment I, I need to attend to something. So um, anyway, yeah, I was working with Dave Way a lot, and Dave was working on um, Macy Gray's second record. We right. all remember and love Macy Gray. What an yeah. artist. Oh, my God. Um and uh, Dave called me up and he's like, hey, we need some help on this record. You have time. You want to come? I was like, absolutely. So um, came down, started working with Macy. Um, Macy was about halfway through the record. And um, for lack of a better term, she started taking a little too long, too, speaking of deadlines. Right. And so Sony started knocking on the door. They're like, hey, we get his budget's going through the roof. We got to get this record done. And so they called up Rick to kind of come in and executive produce, meaning like, the, you know, Rick, come, come down to the studio and start, you know, cracking a little bit of the whip to get, mm -hmm. you know, to get things tied up. Everybody was doing their job. But, you know, when you when you're, you know, working at we were at Record Plant at the time when you're working, you know, um, you know, in these great rooms, not even beyond just the great rooms, but, you know, you. You want to write another song and then, you know, it just keeps going on and on. And unless you have to say, OK, those are the 10 songs, you know, it, it's got to be done. Sure. Like, you know, and going that, And that's exactly what happened, by the way, on Dangerous. 
Michael kept recording and recording and recording and recording until um, the time came for Sony to say no more. And right. then when Sony said no more, we got the record done. <laughs> that's exactly it's exactly how it happened. Swear to God, um, you know. I mean, we finished it, but but if uh, you know if Sony hadn't said okay, we're pulling the we're pull, pulling the the budget plug, and, you know who knows it could have been st still being recorded now. So mm. anyway, back to to Rick. Um, yeah. So Rick came in as um, to executive produce that Macy record. Um, and kind of co-produced too. It was, you know, there in the studio every day and stuff. Um, and that was it. I met him there and I became, you know, chummy with him. And then he started calling me for a bunch of projects. Yeah. Um, which was, you know, I mean, when you work with Rick, <laughs> it's like amazing record is kind of his middle name. Right. You know, every, everything he's working on is, is going to be like super cool and, yeah. and lead to like those cool credits that I was luckily involved in. Yeah. Because on to uh, you mentioning in, in the list of credits, but on on uh, on to Audio Slave, I remember when we were working on Macy's record. Because um, Rick was talking about it a little bit that Rage had just kind of broke up and they were looking for uh, a new lead singer. <laughs> and that's that's kind of how it, you know, happened. Um, Rick kind of helped them you know move some things yeah. around at least this is what i remember and they were like hey you know cornell is doing this solo thing and maybe he'd want to maybe he'd want to do a you know a jam session with you guys and see how it goes and then and that's that's what he did he connected the dots and yeah and i was told that they uh chris just took a flight down here to la and they did a jam session at leeds and then the next thing you know it was audio slave and and you were there during the recording no 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 that was of just the record that, well, I was there during the recording of the record, yeah. but but not at that stage. That stage no. was like four guys, in a, you know, in a rehearsal hall, just meeting and like, yeah. you know, um, and that's that's how that's how Audio Slave came to came to be, yeah. came to birth was was Rick just, you know, took up the phone and <laughs> started calling me. Yeah. Wow. So it was, yeah, wow. it's funny. Yeah. Rick, Rick has a reputation as being a very zen kind of person and working yes. in a very kind of unique way. What yes. did you, I've asked you a lot in this interview about what you've learned from people, but what did you observe from looking at Rick? And the what did thing you... about Rick is that he applied himself um, to, the, to the project to the degree as was needed. And what I mean by that is like when we were working with Johnny. Um, Johnny Cash. Yeah, Johnny Cash. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, one of those people that can go by a first name, but that was Johnny Cat. We were with Johnny. Um, Rick was so involved there every single minute in the studio, you know, making Johnny comfortable, making sure that things went that way. And what I mean is that he was truly serving the project as need be. Um, with Audio Slave, the way he served the project was he kind of let those guys do their thing because they, you know, they were all rock. They are all rock stars, and they were rock stars. And it was just where they were going to kind of like, you know, come to be. Um, mm -hmm. it, you know, it's almost like, however, you know, I, I can come up with a million analogies, but every project is different. I sure. will, you know, I will say that. In you know, I definitely learned this from Rick. Is that every project, and you need to treat every project differently. Um, because every human being is different, but then, you know, every artist is absolutely different. Yeah. And, um, you know, you just, you have to approach every record. I mean, I've got a method, I guess, that I do, that I learned over the years. But as I get older and more experienced, I learned that that's not something that, you know, it could be acknowledged, but method is not something that, you know, needs to follow suit, you know, in any, in any sense of the world, really. I mean, you got to have a beginning, a middle, and, you know, you got to pick the repertoire, you got to do this, you got to, um, et cetera, do yeah. all those things. But, um, but uh, I'm sure every producer and every film director or whatever has, has a method, but you, you know, you got to be careful not to be too, too regimented um, sure. to a degree, to yeah. a degree, you know. Sure. I'm going to ask you for one last anecdote before we move on. From those okay. periods, 
Is it is it true that um, while Johnny was recording Man Comes Around album, Joe Strummer just started turning up at the sessions yes. to check yes. it out? Yes. Um, I have a great photo somewhere here in my studio of, of me and Joe. Yeah. Um, I, this was amazing, man. I'm probably getting emotional when I say it, but because it was incredible. But Joe was pals with Rick. And he was, it, I think we were recording this summertime, and he was just in L.A. on vacation. Um, and Johnny Cash was Joe's hero. Um, I mean, which is amazing to think about Joe Strummer's hero being this, you know, this, this, but it makes sense in a way. So Joe started to, um, he started to come to the sessions every day and hang out. And I was kind of always the first guy at, you know, at the sessions. I'd get there at noon and Joe would be sitting on the couch by 1130, just be hanging out in the back. And, and he was there every day, just like this, just wow. like, just vibing on everything. And he and I became pals um, because we were there in the room all the time. And I was like, I can't believe every day I go to work. And, and by, you know, by the way, we all know it was, it was Tom Petty's band that was playing yeah. Mike Campbell and like, you know, and Ben Mont, it was, it was mind blowing. And Joe was just sitting on the couch. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you this anecdote because this is a story that um, is amazing and the world needs to know about it. And I, I think there's a photo of it somewhere documented, but, but Joe was so inspired from being around Johnny all the time and just hearing him, the way he talked and the things he was talking about or whatever, that he started writing music, of course, but Joe was a pen, a pen and paper type of guy. Um, no surprise there, but, um, I remember he used to go up to, um, we're working at Rick's house, um, where he had the knee room for a while. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if he's working out of there at all anymore, but, but anyway, we were recording down there and, um, Joe would go disappear, um, and go into another room and write. And I remember, and, uh, this is a mind blowing vision. I had, I had a cell phone back then. This was before cell phones, but, um, I, I walked into the garage and Rick had a, uh, you know, an old seventies Corvette. It was super awesome. We were sitting in the garage and there was Joe Strummer working on lyrics wow. for a song inspired by Johnny Cash. And wow. bro, imagine this. When I say working on lyrics, the only pad he had was this giant pad. The irony and the metaphors here are mind blowing, but he had this giant pad and a big marker and he was working on lyrics. So imagine this car is covered with lyrics that he's scratched out and thrown away and he's doing this and he's writing all fervently and it's all over. And I came out and I was like, this is like a historical rock and roll photograph. Yeah. You know, Joe Strummer writing a song inspired by Johnny Cash and the lyrics are all over this, this, this old Corvette. And I was like, this is unbelievable. It was a moment that, and I, I think that I'm the only one that saw it. Because Joe kind of looked up and I waited and I was like, hey, you're working on some stuff. He's like, yeah. And he was in it, you know? So I just closed the door. I went back down to the session. And I was like, man, what did I just see? <laughs> and, um, and then he, we recorded the song, uh, Long Tall Shadow is what it was called, um, all about Johnny. He put it on the Mescaleros project that he was working on at that point. Um, you know, and it was incredible. I mean, working yeah. with him was just, his energy was so awesome and, Everything was just so, so uh, Smokey Hormel played guitar because Smokey had worked on this Johnny Cash. He's a great guitarist. I haven't seen him forever. Um, but was working on the Johnny Cash record too and recorded the song with Joe that we recorded. And it, it was amazing. And um, the bittersweet part of it, Rod, was that within the year after the record came out, everybody was gone. Johnny was gone. Joe was gone. Uh, it was unbelievable. Yeah. To think like, wow, that that happened. That happened to me. It happened to, you know, everybody involved in the project. But it was just, it was so wild, you know, because Joe what, passed so early. And, yeah. And, yeah. What um, treasured memories, for one. Yeah. But two, the fact that we still have a record. Do you know what I mean? We have we have the music that they made, which is. Yes. You know, and, you know, never... into your, and now to talk about, you know, your input in the industry, it's just like, that's important because, you know, all those credits and how things sat, then it was, you know, super important. And, you know, um, and also too, you know, um, digressing a little bit, but, you know, 
all these memories that I talk about, I, I say this a lot too, we didn't have cell phones. And so inappropriately or not, I wasn't able to grab a camera and get a selfie with Michael or Prince or Joe Strummer. I've got one picture with Joe Strummer, it's great, but it was, it, A, it wasn't appropriate to be doing this, yeah. and B, it just never happened. Um, and there's something kind of cool about that in a way, because, you know, there's only, you know, there's not good photos of Mozart or Beethoven or, Le or whatever it might be. And right. those were the rock stars of their day. Yeah. And their shit just live, it lives on forever. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. In the format that it's supposed to be. You yeah. know, it's not, you know, God, I can talk about this forever, but it's not visual first. Music was... Uh, not visual first. There is obviously an amazing place for the music that's involved for the visual um, medium first. But I'm talking about when it just comes into, you know, recorded material and, you know, um, released music, that's, you know, which is, you know, we're living in a fascinating world on that mm -hmm. topic now because being YouTube is the number one uh, format and platform for recorded music it's it's kind of a it's a head scratcher in a way um, right and that, that's an interesting point that the way that everything's changed over the yeah. years particularly since you've been working has that changed your role at all has it changed the way you approach producing or mixing or songwriting i don't i don't really think so um it's kind of for better or for worse because the music still needs to be exciting or you know or romantic or whatever it might be. And he still see, has to have the emotional content. Um, but the for better or for worse part is that um, we as humans, um, and I didn't come up with this, Brian Eno, who's a guy that I, you know, uh, and it, you talk about a, um, a hero of mine. Brian Eno is a hero. And I, I went to hear him speak many times and he was talking about the visual medium be, you know, it, um, as opposed to the oral medium, which is just the ear. And the human consciousness is we're always going to choose visual first. It's just the way. So what I mean by that is the for better or for worse portion is that when you go on TikTok, you're looking at it and you're hearing it, but you're kind of looking at it first, mm -hmm. the way your brain is processing it. So if it's, you know, a, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is, um, it's complicated. It's complicated for us just in our business and, uh, and us as humans, because, you know, um, the most amazing thing, I guess, is when an artist releases a record is to listen to it first before you see the video. But who does that anymore? Right. Really? Who does that? No one. Yeah. Like it's always, it's the video, um, whatever it might be. And Look, I'm not um, I'm not criticizing, y y you know, the the art form and the format at all. I think it's great. But but I'm saying that, it, you know, it's become the primary um, in a format that's really not the primary. Mm. Yeah. If, if, if I'm making any sense, you know no. what I mean? I mean, yeah. Totally. Yeah. Last, last two things I'm going to ask you, Tom, because you've been so generous, generous with your time. And honestly, I could talk to you all day. I'd still have you yeah, here. It's so now. much fun. I love doing <laughs> it. We'll, we'll wrap this up <laughs> yeah. very shortly. But um, you were talking about all the changes and all your, you know, you've been sharing all your experiences over the past decades. Looking forward, what still excites you about making music and about where technology is going? Oh, well, what excites me personally is that I still get to be involved in projects that are just like so amazing and so in, in things that I, you know, I've never dealt with. Like currently I'm working on an amazing project with, um, and I'll, I can answer your question because it's related to that uh, about this. I'm working on an amazing project with, um, it's a neoclassical record. Now I've never been involved on a classical record before. I came up in a classical world, but obviously I got involved in like, you know, all those other styles of music, pop, rap, pop, uh, hip hop, R&B, Latin, blah, blah, blah. But um, so the way this project came to me um, was I guess through technology and that this artist who's an amazing pianist from Florence, Italy, just reached out to me 
with, uh, with an idea of um, interested in collaborating with me, but she had this idea of a project that she'd work on, had a lot of the music written, et cetera. And, um, you know, we just started this communication again, hats off to technology because, you know, five years ago, maybe wouldn't have been easy. 10 years ago, no way would this project been a, would been able to happen because yeah. she found me, she wrote me to me and we started to communicate. This was about a year ago now. And, um, and it's becoming this incredible project where we're like, you know, we're recording an orchestra in Prague um, next month. And it's, it's amazing. It's unbelievable. I've never been involved with something like this. So um, hats off to technology yeah. um, because there you go. It's enabled us to be able to do these kind of things. And look, um, I will tell you this, um, I'm heading to Prague to, to work with the orchestra and we've got um, John Axelrod is conducting the strings, who's this world renowned um, conductor, which is amazing. By the way, the artist's name is Julia Mazzoni. She's an incredible uh, pianist. Um, look for her on Instagram, she's amazing. And the project's gonna be super duper cool. I've had so much fun creatively working on it. Um, Cause it's just, you know, it'll be out hopefully by the end of the year or sometime soon and it's amazing. But um, but the point about your technology is that, or your question about the technology is that, um, you know, I, I am going there, but there was a big, during the pandemic when we were supposed to be doing the strings, I wasn't planning on being there. So it was literally them recording, me sending all the stuff to them, them recording and sending it back to me. And, you know, the beauty is, you know, just that. Like yeah. there are no borders anymore. Um, but it's, it's just magic. That portion of technology is like, it's, it's incredible what yeah. it's done for us. Cause there's no, there's no, it's limitless. There's no, no borders. That's um, it. It, yeah. And you know, we could talk about all the bad stuff about technology too, because you know, but, but I, I don't necessarily blame in terms of the bad stuff. Um, the the music business or the not music or whatever. I just I I guess I get into the human consciousness because we're all we've all been sucked into it now. Technology is our life. The first thing we do is wake up and reach for the phone and look at this and read that and whatever. And um, we have to have um, we have to have a, a consciousness within ourselves and stuff to be able to like you know put up you know boundaries and limits. You know, on our own. I mean, um, you know, beyond uh, me doing it for my four-year-old and limiting his screen time. You know, we all have to do it. We all have to do it. Because, you know, there was a whole world out there that we existed in way before this thing happened. And it was cool. Yeah. It was cool. There was a lot of cool music coming out of it. There was a lot of cool movies. There was a lot of cool art. There was a lot of cool everything. And so now we're so interdependent on this. It's awesome. But... It's also like, good Lord, it can consume our lives. Yeah. Um, and we got to be careful of that and conscious of that. And yeah. yeah. Great point. Yeah. Great point. Last thing, Jackster is all about giving credit where credit is due. Are there people that you would give credit to? And I'm sure there's a long list, but are there some people that immediately spring to mind that you would give credit to for helping you get where you are today? God, I mentioned a lot of the people, but, um, yeah. and shout out to everybody. Um, that's watching right now, shout out to Rod and Jaxta, because before we got started on this talk, I was telling telling Rod how important um, this gap is that he's filling, because since technology changed and everything became in the digital medium, a lot of times the whole credit thing um, has just fallen by the wayside. And people mm -hmm. don't know who did this and who did that. And, uh, and it's super duper necessary to know because this is how we make our living and what we do and how we do it. And, uh, you know, from the, you know, from the assistant engineer all the way to the mastering engineer, whatever it might be, the arranger, the string players, whatever it is. Um, it's all really important to have all the credits, um, all the credits, you know, aligned and, and stated, um, yeah. as it were. So, um, anyway, um, to your point about, um, people that weren't credited, is that what your question was? I no, think? just just people that you'd give credit to for helping you get where you are today. All those people I mentioned, yeah, from the beginning, you know, all my professors in college to you know down the 
down the, I mean, so many of my friends that were inspirational to get me, you know, going in the studios and then, you know, then the big names, you know, the, the, the Myersons and Dave Ways and, you know, and all the, the guys that I mentored under and, and, uh, and learned from, and, you know, and the, the A&R guys, the record companies, learning a lot from them too, the way they see stuff, um, you know, cause for better or worse, they, a lot of times have a cool vision. Um, you know, Rick, I learned so much from Rick. Um, it, it, everybody, all the artists too. I mean, you learn a lot from the artists and, you know, also because what you learn from the artists a lot of times is, is, um, is, uh, what not to do and what to do, you know, right. and I'd have to go into the specifics of each project and each record about, you know, I mean, Chris Cornell, one of the greatest singers in rock and roll, he, he never warmed up and, and he would get so frustrated with himself and then eventually started to warm up and, and work with the vocal coach and stuff. But I mean, literally one of the greatest singers ever in rock and roll, but yeah. he never warmed up, just went in the studio and expected to hit those, <laughs> I sees and everything else. It was just like, anyway, that's just a funny little anecdote. But, um, <laughs> but anyway, you know, yeah, yeah. I want to credit uh, everybody, Rod, because it's, it's been a wild ride. It's been an awesome ride and it's, it's still a ride. I'm yeah. still, you know, every, every tiny little project, um, big, little, whatever. I mean, this, this, this one I'm doing with Julia right now, it's, it's amazing. And I'm constantly learning. And I'm constantly faced with, uh, I got to make this great. And, um, you know, it's got to sound great. Um, and, um, you know, yeah. master rooms, master rooms, the last chance. That's how I always look at it. Like, you know, <laughs> and then it's on to you. It's on to you guys, like giving it the credit it's needed and, you know, all that fun stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Tom, yeah. Man, thanks so much for your time. Like, honestly, oh, I can't. Dude talk to you for hours but i so appreciate your support of jackster and your um taking the time to do this so for thank sure. you so much um yeah tom russo tom russo.net is probably the place for people to go yeah they want to see what we're up here to. on instagram again nothing against technology but you know um but uh but yeah and thank thank you rod because this is awesome and again you are filling a void that is extremely necessary in the in the current status of the music business in the you know in the digital world where things uh just don't have those credits that uh you know it easily discovered credits yeah well it's yeah. it's our pleasure we're very passionate about it and to that point anyone watching who wants to find out the credits to any of the artists that you mentioned today tom um can go to jackster.com and check them out and good go good Bye. a lot of times my name wasn't spelled right but that's you know that's a whole nother story we'll you get know, that fixed for yeah, exactly. You guys are the ones to fix that. Uh, all Thanks right, so Rod, much, everybody, Tom. Thank you. Yeah, good to see you. Take care, awesome. mate. Have a oh. good one. Ciao. Bye.